Saint on the Mountain. <laughs> Friday, 1981. A Christian holiday. But up on Mount Panorama, Bathurst, Easter produces some pretty pagan activities. Not that all motorcyclists are heathens, but you don't see too many motorcycles in church parking lots, or faces like these singing in the choir. These campers are different from other Easter holiday makers for one noisy, fast and dangerous reason. Production racing specialist Dennis Neal exercises the immensely powerful Honda 1100 around the six kilometres of closed public roads that every Easter become the arena for Australia's oldest and most prestigious motorcycle meeting, Bathurst. similar to this but in standard trim. I'm probably putting out another 30 horsepower. Got a lot more uh, trim in the tires. The slip under him into there. Highest elbow, okay. Well, up on the rear of the DSX 1100 here. Run a little bit wide there, but you watch out, the will pick him up down down this way. Today they practice, tomorrow and Sunday they'll race. Bathurst is an old town and it's been hosting or at least tolerating the Easter races for exactly 50 years. But over that time the tolerance and tempers have sometimes become a little frayed. Well, at one time here they attempted to blow the Carillion up with dynamite. Uh, What's they blew the Carillion? The Carillion's the bell tower in the park there. Uh, oh, hooliganism vandalism in the park, they got in the brony house and smashed all the brony house up, different things like that, it just acts of willful vandalism. One year they took all the seats out of McCaddy Park and threw them into the fish pond and uh, broke the eggs that the uh, swans had laid and you know, and sometimes you just think to yourself, oh well, you know, I won't get amongst that. But it's good for the young people, it's good for the town. Oh well, you get violence with any crowd, like it don't matter what it what functions goes on, there's always violence, isn't there? And a lot of the, the young people who come here are just ordinary, decent people. We don't hold it against a lot of them. We do, oh, no. do regret the, the rough element that uh, 
that play up and, and perhaps give the, the city a bad name. Well, really, they don't cause any trouble to most of the people in town. It's just they cause trouble in a small part of the town. It's mainly at the Mount, I'd say. Thousands of tons of beer will be drunk over the next three days. Some will drink it with their meals, others will drink it instead of them, and a few will remain paralytically drunk for the whole time. But it's simply untrue to paint all the Bathurst arrivals as powerful thirsts on powerful motorcycles. Many have ridden for days, hundreds, even thousands of miles, just to see the racing and to meet again with friends from previous years. That's not to say, of course, that this is a teetotaler's pilgrimage. The secret is to stay just on the right side of the law. Hiding, hiding on the side of the road for me. Where? Oh, just outside of Mount Landy. Oh, yeah, saw those. Ah, somebody, and, uh, and they blocked me. <laughs> for the spectators, arriving means the end of their motorcycling for three days. For the other half, down on the track, the long rides are just beginning. Dennis Neal still practicing and still the big Honda isn't right. This will be a Bathurst which Neil will not quickly forget. Ron Bolden won the senior Grand Prix here last year and Greg Pretty from Phoenix, South Australia, forming with Neil and Bolden the three to beat. I think that guard might uh, grab on your tyres there. You might want to have a good look at them. All the machines are officially inspected for a racing motorcycle as a mass of potential weak links. Only a tiny patch of rubber touches the ground at any time. Stranded cables and lightweight rods control the most crucial functions of clutch, brakes and throttle. Failure of just one of these components on a true racing circuit would be bad enough. But on the collection of ordinary roads, which is Bathurst, there are fences, power poles, ditches, culverts and armco barriers, edging a road designed for Sunday driving. Then there's the mechanics who must ensure that everything is just as it should be. To understand their responsibility to their rider, take a lift to the top of a 20-storey building and on the way up, think about the mechanic who last checked the cable. We may return to the pit. No other team members are permitted on the track other than those specified in this, this section. Only if the team member enters the track at right, only if the team member enters the track at any time, the rider will be black flagged. What we're saying is that we don't want to be Tom Dick and Harry racing out on the circuit. That's really an answer to the question that Moyna, the Moyna uh, asked. She got in too early there. But uh, all of the pit crew stay in the pits. The co-rider and the rider are the only ones who have access to the circuit. Well, the big thing is that it's so totally different from any other circuit. It's not something you just come to for the race meeting on the weekend. It's a you know, full atmosphere. It's, it's a week-long atmosphere. It's something you build yourself up to all the time. Track's demanding, it's fast, and it's got everything there that a racer wants. We really never race on a track anywhere near as fast as this. So uh, it's a circuit where a lot of guys who go good on the tight tracks necessarily might go very well up here. It's very much who's got the biggest heart, I think. It's a matter of getting yourself sorted out and being as smooth as you can. The big thing you learn here is that if someone's going quicker than you, you know, you just ride at what you can. You don't try to catch them because it's not a tractor. Try to overextend yourself. You ride to your limit and that's all.
by Saturday, Bathurst's population has doubled. Today the racing begins, and whatever the local feeling about the descending hordes, there's the inescapable fact that every motorcyclist will need fast food, drink, and somewhere to sleep. It all means money for the town. Perhaps the motorcyclists do make the place look untidy, but you won't find many service stations or milk bars or pubs closing in protest. this morning is the unlimited Grand Prix, a 60 kilometre shakedown for the top riders. from 140 miles an hour, Coleman and Johnson nearly do it all wrong. Just there, and off down the escape road. 64 Greg Pretty leads, chased by Searle Johnson and 59 Ron Bolden. early days and in this race no one's really risking limb or machine. Bolden slows and Pretty riding well within himself is just too good, too together for the rest. Pretty wins comfortably, watched in comfort by the well-ordered crowd down on the flat part of the circuit. Here, as our mothers would say, you meet a better class of person. It's like the lounge bar in a pub. It's a fair hike up the mountain to, well, the public bar, where the track becomes more torturous, up where the traditional Bathursters stake their claim every year. This is where anything goes whether you're feeling laid back in the sun or still hung over from the night before. No one seems to mind much. It may just be the altitude, of course, but Mount Panorama seems to inflict everyone with an almost unquenchable thirst.
early Saturday afternoon and suddenly things become serious. The Arai endurance race, the big money one. 500 kilometers to ride and the reputations of Australasia's best riders and the Japanese factories are all at stake. The officials are nervous. Greg Pretty looking for his second win of the day. These bikes bear at least some resemblance to the sort of motorcycle you can buy off the showroom floor. That's the point of this class of racing. The companies invest heavily in trying to produce a Bathurst winner. It makes good copy for next week's motorcycle press. Soon the race pattern emerges. Phyllis, Neil, Robbins, Pretty, Feeney. The opening laps are lightning fast. That's to be expected. But while the leaders keep up this pace, no one's letting up or settling down. It's not for the faint-hearted. Dennis Neal's Honda has passed Rod Phyllis on the Suzuki. Then it's Neal, Pretty and Phyllis. These three are beginning to clear out from the rest of the field on whom the pace and the distance are beginning to tell. Neal, Phyllis and Pretty, but not for much longer. Phyllis is planning his move. Coming into the front straight, the Suzuki slips under the Honda and Phyllis leads. Pretty watches and waits. Then it's Neil again. No one really knows what happened. When you feel very badly, I always feel, I feel strongly whenever I see anyone go down, it's enough to uh, 
make me want to stop riding. Uh, I witnessed, I was unfortunate enough to witness Rob Morehouse's death last year. Uh, but because of that, something good came out of it. We started a rider safety committee and the very corner that killed Robbie Morehouse has all been fixed, there's sand traps and uh, there's runoff area. And we were able to get a lot of corners changed here. It cost the Bathurst City Council a lot of money, but they were willing to do it. So we're hoping that bit by bit we can get this place reasonably safe and then we will see overseas riders come out because uh, overseas riders wouldn't ride on a track like this. They would just, they, they boggle when they see it. This track is the most dangerous in Australia, one of the most dangerous in the world. The Honda team now switches its attention to number two rider Vince Sharp. The show must go on. Honda will still search for the win. Dennis Neal has reached hospital alive. Now it's Suzuki and Yamaha. Phyllis and Pretty fight on. Phyllis pits for fuel. Watch that orange rag, especially as Phyllis leaves. You can just see a flash of orange as the rag wraps itself around the rear wheel. Spare a thought for the Suzuki mechanic whose oil rag has disappeared into the spoke of Phyllis's wheels. Surely 50 cents worth of toweling can't stop $10,000 worth of motorcycle. Pretty pits. How are we doing? Sixty seconds in front. Huh? Sixty. Sixty. A minute. Okay. Sixty seconds, Greg. A moment of concern. The Yamaha won't start. But when it does, they don't see Greg Pretty for dust. Greg Pretty is $3,000 happier. Castrol, Yamaha, and it seems Tui's will also be more than pleased. Vince Sharp has earned his airfare from New Zealand. But with two wins to his name, the day belongs to Pretty. Tomorrow he'll contest the Australian Grand Prix, but that's another day. Dennis Neal regains consciousness in hospital. Wave to London. <laughs> oh, I got my hat on. <laughs> You'll have one. Oh, hang on.
Don't tell me, you want me to get Marshall for this race, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up. No, Dave. Dave, Dave. Dave, Dave. Dave, Dave. Sidecar racing has probably done as much as any branch of the sport to paint motorcyclists as mad, bad and dangerous to know. The peculiar sight of grown men hurling themselves around public roads on three-wheeled platforms seems to fire the imagination of the gang up the hill. Odd behaviour breaks out. up, things become mildly gladiatorial on the hill, and in their midst, a lone chicken impersonator. <laughs> Jeff Taylor and Barry Fraser win easily. Ray Spence and Laurie Nichols almost make Bathurst history by finishing backwards, and then have to claim their second place the hard way. Motorcycling provides its fair share of walking wounded and after a long hot day on the grog, just walking presents its problems. With the racing finished for the day, the crowd on the hill turn their thoughts to Saturday night. Solid drinking, of course, and there'll probably be some sort of altercation with the police. And acts, not for family viewing, that all go to prove that Bathurst at Easter is everything except normal. Down in the pits compound, the officials, the riders, the mechanics, the sponsors, and their friends and families spend Saturday night far more quietly. A few yarns over a few beers. There are plans to be made about tomorrow's racing, repairs to be sweated out by torchlight, 
and everywhere the realisation that for those down here, there is a tomorrow. Up on the mountain, the troops are getting restless. The police become uneasy. A rock is thrown, an arrest is made, more rocks, more arrests, fighting, anger, more punches, more arrests. It seems to happen most years. But now the motorcyclists have formed a lobby group to make the point that it's not all their fault. What brings that on? What brings that on is we, the riders, put in $350,000 minimum just to come through the gate, we put in probably nearly a million dollars in petrol, hamburgers, beer, counter twos in that town down there, and we can't even get a decent toilet. There's no showers on the mountain. There's 8,000 people on this mountain, and there's no showers. There's minimal fresh water. There's, the toilets are disgusting. You know, look, I've been talking to the old timers today. I've been here 17, 20 years, and they say, well, that's what we want. But we're talking about a big number of people, 35,000 people. They should be catered for. Just because they're bikies doesn't mean they're animals. We were placed in a very, very difficult position here tonight. You've only got to look out here. Look, it's like a, it's like a, a dump. Broken bottles, stones. Look at, the, look at the missiles that we've got had. Vehicles damaged, police injured, because they want to put on a stir with the coppers. Well, we're not going to take it. Most of these guys would just uh, grog on around their campfires all night if there wasn't... You know, the only, the only entertainment on this mountain is the police station until we've tried to help. And what, yeah, and what's happened? Um, everybody's let us down. We've got nothing, you know? I mean, we've, this is, like I said, all out of members' pockets. The motorcyclists have tried to improve the image. We've done our job. And we feel we've been let down. But there's always a few rat bags. They have a complete freedom of the hill here. They have fun on their motorbikes, they can do all sorts of things here, but they seem to get bored and desire to turn their attentions on a bit of a stir on the police. There's a lot of bad media cover too. You wait till tomorrow's papers. There'll be stuff about riots and things like that. I'm only a little bloke, I've got a broken leg. It's in plaster, but I can walk around here perfectly safely. In an effort to distract attention from the police and fight the nothing to do syndrome, the Motorcycle Riders Association have hired a band for the night. After the arrest that have disappeared in the paddy wagons, the band find a rather appropriate song. that rock music might provide an alternative to rock throwing. But by the time the band swings into action, the crowd is quietened anyway, pacified by man's oldest anaesthetic. once a year and have Bathurst. Bathurst is Christmas, New Year, birthday yeah. and everything else for a bike. Bathurst Bathurst is it's Christmas. all tied yeah. into one mate, not only that, it's Easter as well at Bathurst. Sunday morning and with the exception of two spectators who appear to have been here all night, there's a profound sense of the morning after the night before.
He looks like everyone feels. Down in the pits, the sun comes up over a rather more tranquil scene. It's still hard to get up, but there are fewer of the end-of-the-world hangovers. Sunday morning down here has more of a domestic feel. the tinnies are opening and recovery is swift. <laughs> There's no real antagonism between the hard eggs on the hill and the straighter scene down on the flat. They're all into motorcycling. For rider Andrew Johnson, there's a serious reason for being here. Competitors uh, have got a lot of friends up in the mountain. Uh, who have followed them, fan clubs and etc. But they still shut themselves off completely from up the mountain, all the bikies and the other people. They concentrate mainly in the pits here on racing and that's it. They shut themselves out from everything else. The guys with the bikes have got budgets are very, very low naturally and they tend to uh, scrimp and scrape and you know, they, they come up here in tents and caravans and whatever or sleep in the back of their truck just to race their bikes. So they're, their uh, enthusiasm is much greater, I, I feel, than the, than the, than the uh, actual car racing guys. You don't really have many big races in Australia, other than production. This is a bit of everything. It's uh, somewhere for people to come once a year and some let loose, some don't. We don't get time, we're too busy. We don't see half what goes on. The atmosphere is getting a lot more professional in the, in the pits. Life, so you only have to look around at all the tents and the gear they've got and the backups and the motors and spare bikes and even now spare riders. Um, everyone comes here to win and some have got more money than the others and the one who's most prepared, uh, they win. Sunday is the last day of racing. The last chance to win something or to prove something. For many of the riders, especially the novices who have saved for months, worked as long on their machines and trailered them perhaps hundreds of miles to be here, this is the last fling. The last of the adrenaline, the noise, the speed and the risk. The two big races today are the unlimited production race over 70 miles and the 500cc Grand Prix for pure racing machines. At 10.30 they line up for the unlimited.
The Unlimited settles down to a tight and furious procession. Still Hayes ahead of Hiscock, and then the New Zealander slips through. Seconds later, Malcolm Campbell's race ends. A moment ago, he was the crowd's delight. Now he's a tangled body in a leather bag dumped on the track. Meanwhile, Hayes has repassed Hiscock, but down Conrod straight, the New Zealanders' Suzuki is just too fast for the Honda, and with Campbell gone, only Taylor can stay with them. This will be the dice of 1981. Hayes takes Hiscock. Now, Hiscock again. Then, near race end, Hayes, right on the limit, has hurled the Honda past his cock. At high speed, he's bolt. He loses control and rams the armco. This race has been fought like a war, and as with any battle, there are no prizes for almost winning, however valiantly you fought. Maybe next year. Even as Hiscock, the survivor, wins and the race ends, the mountain picks off one more victim. Well, it's something that we have to accept. Um, it's not a very nice thing to see, but. Um, I suppose if you can avoid the debris, well, uh, you consider yourself lucky and, uh, and keep going. Oh, reasonably petrified. Greg Pretty and Ron Bolden's Pretty mother Moyna are philosophical. Yes, I feel quite sick every time he raises, actually. But uh, when he says oh, real oh, I'm retiring, it'll be quite good. Because I'm really only 16, look at the grey hair. Last big race of Bathurst 1981, the Australian 500cc Grand Prix. Here, the performance of most of the machines is virtually equal. The bulk of them come from the Japanese Yamaha factory. And this technical sameness means that the skill of the rider becomes of foremost importance. If you had to look for the best racing motorcyclist in Australasia, this is where you would start looking. After the intensive jewels of the earlier racing, the Grand Prix becomes a procession. To the casual observer, it might be a bit of a disappointment, but to the enthusiast, the race is a tribute to the excellence of the 22-year-old rider from North Sydney, number 59, Ron Bolden.
This is as close as Pretty will ever get to Bolden, but this time he's not quite fast enough. Bolden showed them all the way round last year, and now in 1981, on this bike, on this track, he's simply unbeatable. Dennis Neal, from his bed and hospital, announces his retirement from motorcycle racing. It's time to go home. <laughs>